Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another Green Room chat here on the Dallas Symphony's Facebook page. Uh, we're going to do this just a little bit differently today. Um, instead of Kim Noltme interviewing um, an artist or friend of ours, we are going to have two of our DSO musicians interview Kim so we can learn a little bit more about her. So our musicians who are our interviewers today are Daphne Vol and Alex, Alex Keenly. And Daphne, why don't you go ahead and start us uh, this morning and let's go. Oh, we have you still on mute, Daphne. Sorry about that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Kim. Thank you for agreeing to do this interview. This is a treat for us. So tell us a bit about your childhood. Where did you grow up? And what are your earliest musical memories? Um, so I grew up in a uh, part of Boston called Dorchester, um, made famous by sort of some of the classic movies like Goodwill Hunting and things like that. So that fun accent from Boston. But I went to bilingual school when I was young um, and started studying Spanish in first grade, which is why uh, people often comment that I don't have the Boston accent um, because I was learning to speak Spanish, you know, almost at the same time I was learning all the English grammatical rules. Um, later, when I was older, we moved to a suburb south of Boston. Um, my first musical memories are going to family concerts at the Boston Symphony conducted by Harry Ellis Dixon. And um, I went with uh, my mom and also we had school trips uh, to go there. So, uh, and then of course I did um, start playing the flute when I was in fifth grade, but not very well. Never, never got there with the flute. <laughs> Thank you. Alex? Hello, sorry, I had to switch devices. I had a, my computer crash. Can you hear me? Yes. So you hold a Bachelor in Arts, oh, sorry, a Bachelor of Arts in East Asian Studies from Smith College. Would you mind sharing your college experience with us? Um, sure. So I uh, got into Smith College early decision, which was great, eliminating a lot of the stress. I fell in love with um, Smith College when I went on a visit um, in, you know, just before the time when you'd be submitting applications. Uh, it's a really unique place, all women's college, beautifully set in the Pioneer Valley in Massachusetts. It's part of a five college system with um, UMass, Amherst, Amherst College, Hampshire College, and Mount Holyoke College. Uh, so it was a great place uh, to study. When I went to Smith, I originally thought I was going to be a psychology major, and I kind of started out with that in the first semester, but I had already studied, I was fairly fluent in Spanish at the time, having had roughly 12 years of Spanish, um, so I decided I would study a new language, um, and I wanted to choose something that wouldn't get confused at all with Spanish, so I chose Japanese. And I had such a fantastic Japanese professor, and it's a very intensive when you're learning um, an Asian language in particular. Usually, you have to have it every day, and it's you get, you know, it's a big part of the your curriculum at least initially. And so I uh, fell in love with the the language, the country, and so I ended up um, deciding to uh, to major in East Asian studies. My focus was really Japan and, and Japanese. That's quite interesting. Uh, how well do you speak Japanese? Um, I have conversational Japanese now. I, I do, I mean, when I go to Japan, I haven't been to Japan for a few years, but when I go, I get quite good because I obviously uh, studied it um, to the point where I was fluent and got a job at a Japanese company initially when I graduated from college. So uh, it's still in my brain. I really should practice it more, but I don't like many things that we should do that we don't do. Um, and so I, and I also promised myself I get my Spanish um, back to what it used to be 
because I am here in Texas where there are many Spanish speakers and I haven't really done that either. So I have some things that I need to work on. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can write and read Japanese as well? Um, I don't know a lot of characters now, but I used to read and write. I, you know, my paper for graduation was a, a, like a six page paper in Japanese that I wrote um, and uh, I had to read a book um, and a Japanese book and translate it. So yes, uh, back then I was uh, quite good. If you don't use the characters, you, you tend not to remember them, but I enjoyed actually writing them because it's, you know, it's not calligraphy when you're not using a calligraphy pen, but there's a system where you're, you do it in a certain order and there's kind of an artistry to everyday writing which i enjoyed a lot that's interesting thank you so before you joined the uh, dallas symphony as the rose perot president and ceo you worked for the boston symphony in a variety of roles first as director of sales and marketing then as chief marketing officer and finally as chief operating and communication officer where else did you work before that and what led you to the boston symphony so um, I worked uh, in Massachusetts for the Office of uh, Travel and Tourism and also assisted with the trade office there on some projects, um, which was how I originally came in contact with the Boston Symphony, other than the fact that I would go to concerts when I had time. Um, and so I was, uh, we would create um, missions for the governor and business delegations to go to places where the Boston Symphony was touring. So Europe um, or Asia were the two primary locations. And I oversaw everything that was happening for this state um, with related to tourism um, in Asia. So Seiji Ozawa was the music director. So there was a lot of visits to Japan in particular. And so that's how I got to know the folks at the Boston Symphony. I also um, did consulting work for a private company that did trade relations. And I was connecting the Boston Symphony with potential sponsors for the tours, again, because it worked for our clients and that work, not, I didn't necessarily do it because I was trying to help the Boston Symphony. It was just the, the, what, what I needed to do. And you have to think of a time, which is unfortunately different from now, where orchestras uh, that were well-known touring Europe or Japan, it was like getting a ticket to the Super Bowl. So the only way any client of ours could ever get a ticket to go was if they were a sponsor or they were associated with one of the sponsors. So um, anyway, that all happened. And then um, I decided my, I had a son who was um, young um, and my daughter uh, was six months old and I just didn't want to travel. And my job was traveling basically two weeks of every month. And I didn't want to travel anymore. So I um, decided I needed to find a job that didn't require traveling. And coincidentally, um, a position was open at the Boston Symphony for a while. They were struggling to fill it, the this, this sales and marketing position, which someone was leaving. And this was a, you know, we can train someone kind of idea. So it, it was a good transition. And so I thought, wow, that sounds like a really great opportunity to not only uh, have a position in an organization like that, in one of the iconic cultural institutions, uh, but also to get the chance to kind of learn the ropes of the arts of music, uh, marketing from the person who's there, you know, whereas most jobs you come in and you're, you know, drinking from a fire hose immediately. So anyway, uh, it all worked out. It was, uh, I ended up getting the position and um, over time, uh, well, they weren't doing a lot of marketing to be honest with you. It was a super easy job when I started. Uh, and I was kind of like, wow, how lucky am I? I? Work for this great place. It's not a hard job. I can do it really easily. And then 
um, me being me was kind of like, well, you should do this and you should do that. And we should change this and we should change that. And then the next thing you know, I had 13 people reporting to me and all these other departments that ended up being part of marketing from, you know, the, the gift shop to um, the front of house. And so in the end, um, I was responsible for a lot of operations at Tanglewood and, and I ended up getting promoted after um, being there a while to chief marketing officer where I still had all of those responsibilities was an elevated role in the organization and then to chief um, operating and communications officer. Okay. And in 2018, you left the Boston Symphony to become the CEO of our orchestra. What's your vision for the Dallas Symphony and what's the Dallas Symphony's role in our community? Well, I was very excited when I heard that this position was open um, for a variety of reasons, but, uh, you know, I felt like Dallas, um, the orchestra and the city is an incredibly, um, is ambitious. And I'm not a status quo person at all. So that was very important to me. The very strange situation when, I decided that I should probably look at other positions leaving Boston was there were seven CEO jobs open at that time, which is pretty much never happens, right? And of course you could just, you know, interview for a whole bunch of them. And I really researched all the different um, organizations and I found that Dallas had what I consider the most potential um, to be, sort of the 21st century orchestra. And I say that not in a grandiose way, but in a way that the world is changing so dramatically. And we actually need to um, think about that and how can we possibly, um, you know, position orchestras to, to be in the, the world that we live in now. And that's before all the coronavirus uh, and everything else, the social unrest. Uh, and so it was very exciting to me, and I believe that this orchestra is incredible artistically. Um, you know, obviously that resonated with Fabio Luisi because we were able to get him to um, join us as the music director. And I think that he also sees the Dallas Symphony in Dallas in the same way I do as a place where we can um, move the or move the industry forward there's a lot of um support by the board to think differently think out of the box try things and see what we can do to build audiences beyond what is typical in a city of this size and with the background of this city, meaning it's not one of the original kind of cities with arts for 200 years and that kind of thing. And so I think it's an exciting time. I mean, this coronavirus is certainly nothing we could have expected. And it's uh, in one way, I mean, it's horrible in many ways, but in one way it has the ability to have organizations really focus on what's important and building relationships with the city, with their, in our case, with our, the orchestra and management, with the board, the orchestra and management. And, you know, it's, it brings us together in a, in a way that you wouldn't normally do so quickly. It would take years and years to build that same kind of relationship. So, I am an optimist, so I always focus on the positive rather than the negative. Clearly, it's not fun to um, deal with financial stress and not being able to have concerts on a regular basis and all of that. But if we're building an infrastructure um, to come out of this successfully, uh, then in a way, we won't really focus on this terrible time in the future if, we, if we're able to move quickly when this is all over. Uh, one of our exciting new initiatives is the Young Musicians Program, which provides free instruments and lessons to children in South Dallas. What was your inspiration for this? 
Um, you know, I really believe in active music making. You know, the uh, the way it works in Dallas, and, and Dallas isn't that different from any other cities, is uh, the systems, the public school systems can really not focus on arts education until the kids are in middle school. And the resources that are required for school districts to be able to do a great job with music education, teaching instruments is is pretty difficult given all of the challenges that they have. So I believe strongly that it is our role as you know the the largest uh, musical organization in the city and in the region to take that responsibility of how we can do our part to educate children. And so school field trips are one thing, but um, basically most of the kids get to come here once every third year. And so it's not as if the school field trip, no matter how fantastic that concert is, it's still not going to change their lives in all likelihood. There's the, you know, the one in a hundred where that might happen, but in general it wouldn't. And so how can we do it? We need a con we need a relationship with kids. We need kids to have a relationship with music. So having an instrument and having um, music lessons on a regular basis can be completely life changing in every way. So even if these kids don't want to play instruments for more than three or four years, they still can become, um, you know, better thinkers and they can learn the discipline and they can uh, have relationships. And there's so many things that they can get out of this. We know from science that it actually helps in brain development. So why wouldn't we want to do this for as many kids as possible? Uh, so we started uh, with a goal, uh, kind of a, a challenging goal, because it's always so, it always sounds easier than it really is. Uh, so we had the goal of having 500 kids, and we just got to that goal before all this happened. And we would love it in the future to be able to have literally thousands of kids having free instruments and lessons several times a week. Uh, if we could do that, we would change Dallas, uh, the future of Dallas, because this would make such a dramatic difference for these children for the rest of their lives. And, uh, you know, but we have, we have the kids we have now, um, still many of them are having, um, lessons uh, digitally, which clearly is not the same, but it's, it's great that that's still happening and that we have that continuity. And we really look forward to when all of this is over and we can get back to having face-to-face. -face. Uh, I was so inspired by the kids performing and how they progress so quickly you know, it's mind boggling when you really know how long it normally takes um, kids to be able to play difficult music. Uh, that I actually went in, in February and bought a cello and started taking cello lessons. And I was kind of like, if these kids can do this, I can do this. I'm going to work really hard. Now, I, of course, I haven't worked as hard as I should, but I am committed this year to like making some real progress on this despite my crazy schedule. Um, but literally, when I was watching these kids playing and how amazing they are just after a few months, I thought about that and I thought, this is inspiring for every single person in a lot of different ways. So anyway, that's my, that's my story on that. So you're also a, a strong advocate of women's rights and equality, and among other things, have started an annual Women in Classical Music Symposium here in Dallas. What changes have you seen over the years in the arts? Um, well, again, Dallas is kind of a unique place in, you know, in the arts as it pertains to women. I mean, and it's not unique totally there are a couple other cities that have this model but uh the dallas symphony has had numerous um women as chairman of the board 
The Dallas Symphony has had a pretty good gender balance for a long time in the orchestra, whereas a, a lot of orchestras are just seeing that gender balance um, change uh, to be closer to 50-50 women to men, you know, in the last 10 years or 15 years. And a lot of the philanthropy in Dallas for the arts has been by women. So you could argue that the arts district, a lot of the arts district formation ideas and implementation um, was by women. So I think that made me feel like we could really um, move forward in a meaningful way here because, you know, the Dallas Symphony, the arts district, the ph philanthropic community are all sort of focused on women, you know, taking a leadership role. We also uh, had a lot of assistant conductors here in Dallas who are women, which again, it's an audition job and, you know, it's just a weird coincidence in a way because we all know how the auditions work. It's not like anyone was saying, oh, let's have a woman do this. That's not how it works at all. But yet, a woman was chosen many times. So I thought that was kind of fascinating too. And so we decided to take it to the next level and make a commitment on an artistic level with um, commissioning and composer in residence and hiring a woman as a principal guest conductor, Gemma New. And the reality is that there are so many talented women and it wasn't hard to find people who deserve these roles in any way, shape, or form. The thing is, is they don't have the same kind of network as the men in their fields do because the fields have been predominantly, um, you know, the conductor field and um, the composition field in terms of actually getting commissioned. Not that there haven't been plenty of female composers, but getting the big commissions has been more male dominated. And as a result, women don't have the same network in the um, conservatories and the colleges and the graduate programs. And so we um, worked to make a commitment to see if we could help with that. And also uh, creating a symposium to talk about all of these uh, issues because if you talk about it, then it brings it to light. So. And that's basically um, my thinking on all of that. So we know that you're a very hard worker and that you spend most of your time at work. Uh, but if you have a few hours left, how do you like to relax? Do you have any hobbies? Um, I like to run and hike a lot. Um, and um, running, I have... I used to run a lot, like I've run marathons and I used to run 10Ks um, on a fairly regular basis. Uh, the last couple of years I was in Boston and since I've been here, I haven't really committed the level of time, although I still like to go out and run a few miles here and there. I mean, I don't do it every day anymore, maybe three or four times a week. Um, and I, so I wouldn't be competing in anything because that would be like totally uh, depressing for me to see the fall. But anyway, <laughs> I I do enjoy it. It's relaxing to me. Hiking, when I first got here, I just really didn't spend the time to research all the different places that you can hike. And with um, the pandemic, I actually, on the weekends with less work and no evening events and dinners, I've um, been able most weekends to get out and do a really good hike someplace an hour or two hours away from here, which has been really fun. Um, I have a lot of friends, so I like to try to keep up with my friends. I have my kids keeping up with all their ac activities. They're, they're old, but they still are very active. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I mean, I love to read. I haven't been reading a lot. I mean, I feel like all I read is coronavirus um, research and PowerPoint presentations on the trends. It's like, it's talk about something you need to know, but not very stimulating for your uh, creativity. Uh, so yeah, that's mostly what I do for fun. I'm not that exciting these days. You mentioned your kids. You're the mother of two young adults. Would you like to tell us about them? Um, sure. I have a daughter um, who is 23 and is um, 
living in New York and um, she is uh, study, about to get a master's degree in architecture in the fall, um, hoping schools are in session so she's not doing it all digitally because architecture is a hard one to do just online. Um, so she'll be going to MIT in the fall and we're very excited about that. And she, and my kids both grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, you know, we lived in the same um, little tiny Cambridge house across the street from a park. So we were in sort of a neighborhood where we knew everyone. So she knows a lot of people in the city. So it'll be kind of fun to be back in Cambridge for her. She's been in uh, New York for a couple of years. And my son um, is kind of an entrepreneurial guy and has an education business helping students in China um, get into schools in the US. And he also has some other um, businesses he's working on related to cryptocurrency and things like that. So um, he right now is uh, in um, an island in the middle of the Pacific waiting out the coronavirus. So um, he's, he's on Saipan, which is in the Northern Mariana Islands. So he's kind of a unique character. He, uh, he went to grad school uh, for education and um, yeah, so who knows what he'll be doing in the future. Denise, do we have time for a few more questions? Um, from you all or do, would you like me to take questions from online? Oh yeah, it's time for online questions, right? Okay, <laughs> terrific. Um, the first question that we have is, since you have been working with us in Dallas, are there one or two performances that stand out to you? Oh gosh, that's a hard question. Um, of course, when we had our first uh, performance with um, Fabio Luisi um, after he was named music director, uh, I felt the energy and excitement of what was going on in the Meyerson. Um, you know, that those are kind of the unique moments when, uh, you know, it's, it isn't so much about like the perfection of the music or anything. It's about this kind of spirit and energy that is palpable and contagious and the audience feels it. And I think that that is really, um, those are the things that I remember more than a piece of music played well. And, you know, the Dallas Symphony sounds great night after night, which is another thing that I love about this orchestra is bringing it to the stage every night. Um, and, you know, I'm sure people who are not in this business would say, what do you mean? Doesn't every orchestra do that? Well, not always, because it is a grueling season, you know, and it's a lot of music and it's hard to bring your 100% to the stage every night. So, um, I love that this orchestra does this so that each each night when I come to a concert, I feel like, wow, it's going to be fantastic. And also, we we I'm privileged that I get to go to multiple concerts, right? So I go to the first one, the second one, the third one. And so you can kind of see, this is the beauty of live music. It's not the same every night. And minor adjustments are made um, and it make and it's really fascinating to see when you're able to listen to that and you know I'm someone who's gone to literally hundreds of concerts a year for you know decades well at least for like since my kids have been old enough that I didn't I could have uh, I didn't have to feel too guilty about leaving them to be at, um, at multiple concerts a week and you know it's a great joy for me and i crave that so much now uh i don't like listening to recordings i like hearing live music and the sound of an orchestra is absolutely incredible it's so big and powerful and it really i i think of my best ideas when i'm sitting in a concert and my mind starts to um, sort of wander into just like being in the moment. Thank you so much. Um, our final question is, when you moved here and um, came to Dallas, what about Dallas surprised you? 
Uh, well, I've told a lot of people about this, um, especially friends of mine in, in Boston. Uh, and it sounds cliche, but the warm, welcoming, open kind of communication style here was just so surprising to me because of course when you're new in a job especially you feel that you should be very sort of um conservative don't say anything that might upset people you know you're you're not really yourself at the beginning because you're trying to assess the situation and people would just be so enthusiastic about me being here and after just a couple months they say they would appreciate me I've, I've never in my life felt so appreciated and I'm not sure that it's really me I mean I think it's like people appreciate people here which is a wonderful thing but I literally feel that anything can happen because there's such great support and energy and there's a forgiveness too. So yes, there's appreciation, but there's also, okay, don't worry, you made a mistake, we can get through this. And to me, that means you can do, be your best self and do your best work in that kind of environment. So that really shocked me because I didn't know anything about that. I mean, I knew about the sort of, we can do it spirit, but this is very different and actually more important. Thank you so much. Um, it's been great getting to know you a little bit better from a different side. And Alex and Daphne, thank you so much for, um, for moderating our discussion. And we will be back next Friday morning with the Green Room Chat. So go ahead and stay tuned to our Facebook page and we will announce the new interviewer or interviewee next week. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne and Alex. You, thank you're you. amazing. I appreciate your being here this morning. Thank you. Our pleasure.